Hi, this is Bob for Truth. I want to do a, a video talking about an article that I saw in National Geographic. And it's an interesting uh, article. It's about uh, it's a sort of mega flip. So there was this geologist who, uh, <laughs> geologist who basically uh, challenged the traditional notion of geologists, basically their religion, that um, there was this gradual process that took place and that caused these formations. Um, throughout, you know, throughout Earth, but specifically in the United States in certain um, places, he saw evidence of a, of a flood. And so I just want to cover it. And the point of me doing this is just to show you how, you know, one, God has made these things evident um, based on the biblical stories and the biblical account, and that people who claim to be scientists will on one hand say they're scientific and they just follow the data and you know, that's the beauty of science. We just follow the data and it's not a faith-based thing, you know. But then when they see with their own eyes, they reject the data outright. So formed by mega floods, the place, this place fooled scientists for decades. So geologists couldn't account for the strange landforms in eastern Washington state. Then a high school teacher dared to question the scientific dogma of his day. Now, this isn't talking about Kent Hovind. This is a high school teacher who will read about who actually was interested in this and actually went and got a PhD and learned all this stuff. So just to show you some of the formations, these are, you know, the formations. This is in Washington State. This is a really odd looking formation, right? Um, it's like it's, you can tell it's sort of an elevated land mass and it just looks like the water just sort of carved out the land and that was that little centerpiece where it obviously went around, right? And this is a remnant of a lost landscape uh, this island of ancient soil crowned by a crop of wheat survived a, look what they say, it survived an ice age flood that sculpted the region known as the Channeled Scablands. Scablands. So again, they're going to throw in the ice age, which is, you know, that's the story that they're given to deceive children because you got to have an account for if this formed gradually over, think about this. If you want to say that there wasn't a worldwide flood like the biblical account, but they acknowledge that it had to be a lot of water that formed, that formed these um, formations, you can't have it that it happened rapidly and cataclysmic as the Bible teaches, but you have to have a lot of water. So where do you get a lot of water and have that water actually trickling through over large, a large span of time? Well, now you need the Ice Age. You need to say, well, there was this period where there was a lot of ice that built up. And so, no, it wasn't this, 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 you know, um, cataclysmic event that is accounted in the Bible in Genesis. No, it had this, this, you know, it was an Ice Age. It happened over a long period of time. And this ice, this ice melted when the ice melted it caused it carved out these channels but that happened over a large period of time that's how we can explain it with the bible that's why they give our kids you know car cute cartoons and that cart those cartoons are you know nice and funny but it's satan's way to prime uh, our children's mind and to bias them into believing this lie of um you know billions and billions and billions and billions of years so there's a formation i just want to show you that um, and it just basically talks about these things. I'm not going to go through the whole article. I want you to go through and read it yourself. But look at this formation here. Right? Remember, God talks about the, the earth cracked open. He talked about the water coming from beneath. Remember, it's like the, it, was, it was, they hadn't had rain, right? But um, it talked about also the depths cracking open, right? And the water coming from beneath. In fact, let me... Um, let me go through. Let's see if I can find something along those lines. Um, you must give me that. I just want a Bible. I, I do not like commentary. I don't want, I do not read commentary with regards to, I read commentary to find out what they're trying to get me to believe. I don't read commentary to verify anything. I don't, I don't really believe, I don't believe in 
um, studying the Bible with man's commentary. Um, you study the Bible, you have the Holy Spirit, and you, you that's the way you do it. Okay. Let's go here. And here. All right. Let's just go here. So you just want the Bible itself. You don't want anything else. All right, cool. So, in the selfsame day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth and the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them into the ark, right? Eight souls. They and every beast after his kind and all the cattle after their kind and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind and every fowl after his kind, every kind of every bird of every sort. And they went into unto the Noah into the went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Who shut him in? The Lord sealed him, shut him in, sealed him. Jesus Christ is that ark. Once you believe, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, right? Baptized, right? Not by the water, but by the Spirit, right? Is the Spirit that quickeneth to give life. And the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth, and the waters prevailed, and was increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. So it talks about these waters, the waters increase and bear up the, the ark, right? It talks about the earth. And some of these talking about the uh, great fountains of the earth sort of coming and cracks in the earth, and the water prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high heels that were under the whole heaven were covered. Does it say some some of the high heels were covered? It says all of the high heels up under the heaven were covered. That means it there wasn't a peak of land anywhere. All the high heels were covered. So it says 15 cubits upward did the waters prevail and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beasts and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Because you got to remember, what does it say about the 40 days? The flood was 40 days upon the earth. 40 days, right? 40 days upon the earth of the flood. How long were they in the wilderness? 40 years up in the wilderness, right? Um, you know, Jesus tempted, right? 40 days. Like, so it... You, you see all these things, it's all pointing to Christ. All these things about Christ, Jesus Christ is the ark, right? We're not baptized by water. The water is death, but actually you baptize by the spirit. The spirit giveth life. Uh, the seal is the Holy Spirit. The spirit seals us. All you got to do is believe. It's not about what you do, right? Uh, it, it, it's, it's just simply being saved by uh, Christ, being saved in Christ, right? That whole gospel, you know, the gospel is, you know, that Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, right? And that baptism is talking about your death, the death of you, the death of your flesh, and that being raised again, raised by, quickened by the spirit, that's saying that's the spirit of God. And Romans 4, 5 is saying how it's talking about the righteousness of God. We have the righteousness of God. If we were to go and look at Romans 4, 5, we would see that to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David described the blessedness of man unto whom God did what? Imputed righteousness without works. Blessed, saying blessed is the man whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are what? Covered, right? What did the water do? The water covered all of the mountains of this earth, everything. This world is a world of sin. That's why God said, my kingdom is not of this world. So when people try to teach you and convince you that, hey, there's going to be some kingdom set up here on this earth. When God says, no, the kingdom of God is in you, meaning that's Christ in us. And he says, the kingdom of God is at hand, meaning I'm, I'm a child of God. I'm offering you that cup of water, which is the gospel, the gospel of salvation. And I tell you, hey, it's coming. Everything on this earth shall perish. What does it matter if a man gained the whole world and loses his only gotten soul? And I give you the gospel and I say, look, 
You know, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory. There's only one way you can be saved. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. He says you need to believe that gospel. You need to believe that Christ died for our sins, was buried. He rose again the third day. According to the scriptures, you believe that you pass from death to life and you shall not come to condemnation. And that story of Noah, you know, is they were eating and they were drinking and giving, marrying and giving in marriage. And what happened? It just suddenly it came upon them, right? So we're talking about that. It's not based on your works. It's not based on your flesh. It's just based on believing the gospel because the sin is what? Unbelief. John 69, of sin because they believe not on me. So we have the flood account. And the Bible talks about how the water came and talk about how it was 40 days and 40 night, nights and it covered every high mountain, right? Covered every, every high mountain. And so it covered everything on this earth and everything that had breath died, right? Birds couldn't fly. They couldn't hang out for 40, you know, they couldn't hang out for 40 days of just flying, right? They get tired. They got to rest. So they, they died. So the only things that were in that ark, that's the only thing that survived in that ark being Christ. And they needed to be sealed by Christ. They weren't sealed by hands, all that kind of stuff. So blessed is the man whom the Lord will not impute sin. It's not saying you don't sin. Of course we sin in our flesh. If we say we have no sin, we're lying. The truth is not in us. But it's Christ in us, the spirit in us that doesn't sin, the seed, which is Christ. So... Um, that, that's the beautiful thing of that. So I just want to show that. I think that's important to read the actual account. Going back to National Geographic. So National Geographic showing these pictures. I mean, you just heard the story about how the ark was lifted up. Think about all the water that's coming and at what rate that water must be coming to where it's lifted up. Right? So the earth, talk about how the, 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 the earth sort of opening up and it's water gushing out, right? Because there's water under the crust of the earth at that time. And there's actually still are. I saw a thing in um, Africa. They showed this underwater. They call them underground lakes. So tall as a five-story building, this wall of volcanic basalt in Dreshumler Channel took shape, and here's the lie, 10 million years ago as lava cooled, shrank, and cracked vertically. Massive floods ripped away sections, creating this pillar landmark, right? They got it. They got it. Even when they know that it fits the Bible narrative, Satan can't. You have to hang on to part of the narrative of, no, the earth is, you know, millions and millions of years old. And this happened over a long span of time. Because even though this guy is revealing the Bible narrative, these National Geographic guys, they can't just let it be true. Right? Say they just can't have it that it's true like that. All right. So for that matter, so was the source of that answer. A high school teacher named Harley Bretz in 1909, the Seattle school teacher visited the University of Washington to see a, a survey by the U.S. geological people. The new top, topographical topographic map of the Quincy Basin. Quincy Basin, a large area of the west side of Columbia Plateau. He was 27. He had no formal training in geology. But when he looked at the map, he noticed a striking feature, a huge cataract, much like Dry Falls, on the western edge of the basin, a place where the water appeared to spill out of the basin into the Columbia River, gouging a canyon several hundred feet deep. The fall would have been bigger than Niagara. But there was no apparent source of water for them. No signs whatsoever of a river leading to that cataract. Like, where does water come from? Right? Uh, and there's no source, no sign, no source of it. There's not even a river. Right? So even from the Ice Age account, you'd be like, well, where did it come from? Because if the water formed, when it melted, it would have carved into the land. Right? But the earth talk, in the Bible talks about how the land was, was water was under the surface of the cross and came up through the, the, the surface, right? So there was that and there was other stuff, but I'm saying that was one of the accounts of the Bible it talks about how that water came from, you know, places within the cross. So then Brett, this guy, asked the facility in the department about the feature called Potholes Cooley. I think I'm pronouncing that right, I don't really know. But they had no answer for him, nor could they explain many of the unusual features of the region. Then, when his legend has it, Brits decided to become a geologist. He earned his PhD from the University of Chicago four years later. Changed his professional name from Harley to J. Harlan. 
sound more re respectable. And in 1922, returned to the eastern to eastern Washington to take a closer look at the plateaus and its scablands. And after two seasons in the field, his conclusions shocked himself. So basically, this guy is actually, you know, scientists say they look at the data. This guy is actually someone who believed that you actually looked at the data, right? And because he was an outsider, he was like, yeah, this is what I think. It sounds very interesting. I'm going to, I was a high school teacher. I'm going to go back to school and I'm going to learn this stuff. He went and got his PhD in geology, right? And he actually is looking at data. So he had this hypothesis and he didn't know. He went and got to school. The only possible explanation for all the region's features was a massive flood. Perhaps the largest in the Earth's history. Uh, the rainbow would tell you that. Yes, for sure. A debacle, debacle which swept the Columbia Plateau, ripping soil and rock from the landscape, carving canyons and cataracts in a matter of days. All of the hypotheses meet fatal objections, he wrote in a 1923 paper. Just to show you some more pictures, look at this. I mean, anybody who's been in rain, just go out to, way too good it rains, go out into the rain and look at the dirt, and you will see these patterns in rain, in a, in a much smaller form, but you'll see these same type of patterns. No, you'll see these same type of patterns. These patterns are pretty obvious patterns, whatever. So this is a car by repeat. They say repeat flooding. Of course, they're going to say that. You know, they can't let it be a one-time event. It's got to be a repeat flooding. But uh, I'm going to go past that. Let's go there. So he wrote these, these papers, right? And here's all these things. He's looking at, uh, you know, these formations. Look at that formation, right? And he's talking about how these things, like, he said they carved out these Grand Coleta Canyons up to three miles wide with walls up to a thousand feet high, cut hundreds of waterfalls, washed away entire hillsides, deposited gravel bars hundreds of feet high, carried rocks the size of cars, even small houses, and created a terrain of braided channels across eastern and western, eastern Washington. Look at these. He talks about the elaborate challenge in the bedrock of uh, Babcock Bench, perched 600 feet above the Columbia River, uh, Frenchman Coley, the rock climbers. See this, this, by the way, that's how big this is. That's a rock climber. That's a guy. That's a rock climber. Look at this pattern. This isn't some mechanized thing that did this. This is raised, and that's a rock climber. That's the scale. Now, let's go back to what I showed you earlier, just so you can see the scale. Look at that. That's how small that guy is on these, on the scale of that. Right? So it's amazing. So um, the key to the rapid erosion, Burrett said, was the volcanic basalt that forms the bedrock of the Columbian Plateau. A basalt lava rock cools into rock. It forms a vertical hexagonal pillars that have weak bonds to each other compared to, say, granite, which erodes grain by grain. Basalt can erode chunk by chunk as the pillars separate, so a massive high-energy flood could pluck away the bedrock so quickly that the canyon, like the Grand Coulee, might be formed virtually overnight, right? More pictures. I mean, look at that. Really? All right. So, of course, they got to give you the Ice Age narrative because, again, science can't, they can't acknowledge that. Where'd all the water come from, right? So, <laughs> Brett's research was thorough, and his map of the Channel Scoblins was so accurate that it virtually that it's a virtual tracing of modern-day satellite images, creating the immediate impression of channel, channeled floodwaters. But his audience, none of whom had actually visited, much less studied the Scablins, was having none of it. Brett's hypothesis was not just wholly inadequate, in the words of one critic, but preposterous and incompetent. Compounding the problem of his unlikely hypothesis was the question of where all this water came from, right? Where did all this water come from, right? And Brett's had no convincing answer, right? Now we gotta, we gotta interject the, you gotta interject the uh, ice age, right? 18,000, 13,000 years ago, blah, 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 scoured. Gotta interject that because you can't, do not, even if you're proven false, you must never let go right, of your faith of, you know, the earth created itself and the Big Bang and 
over millions and millions and billions of years. You know, just you keep rolling that dice and you keep throwing flour and sugar and eggs and cinnamon and whatever. And one day you just keep doing that and you will get a cake, a, a beautifully formed cake with icing. Because we all know that a beautifully formed, elegant cake is much more complex than all the creatures on Earth and the universe, right? So, of course, if you can do it on, if the Earth formed that way, of course you could perform a, a, a cake could accidentally form out of the blue or just by, but then you, you got a problem. You got to create the actual flour. You got to refine it. You got to, it's, it's an issue, right? You got to have the right temperature and it's all got to be the right mixture. Anyway. For more than a decade after Brett's was on the losing side of a preordained, look at these, that was funny, conclusion, as the, order, as the order of geologists who was studying the area concocted one labored hypothesis after another for how the scab scablins feature might have been created by what? Gradual erosion. Can't be that thing that I'm talking about in Genesis. Then in the 1940s, the other shoe dropped. Oh no. Joseph Party, Party? All the time. A geologist for the USG, uh, United States Geological Survey Group, okay, reported that he discovered strong evidence of a massive flow of water in western Montana. A swath of current ripples 30 to 50 feet high, like the sand ripples that might form in a river or a tidal water, but made a gravel in orders of magnitude larger. Their source? Of course. A gigantic ice age lake, glacial lake, Masula, I think that is, that form with the whatever, blah, 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 right? So they admit there had to be this water. But again, the question becomes, guys, where did all that water come from in such a rapid span period of time? It must have been that there was this ice age and then all of a sudden it just melted super fast. So it must have, sun must have got really hot to melt that ice that way. And then, because again, the guy said it was a rush of water, right? So that water must have melted. So that means how hot must it have been had gotten in such a short period of time to melt this water on this ice age? But then you have to have a large thing of, of, of water. So thus, so you must have ice everywhere because that would explain it. You know, that would give an alternative explanation to the Bible narrative, right? Behind that dam, water from the Clark Fort Gallant, forming a lake which was much bigger than Lake Erie and Lake Ontario combined, stretching for hundreds of miles in Montana Mountain River Valleys. That dam broke in a torrent of water with 10 times the combined flow of all the world's rivers barreled into eastern Washington, reaching speeds of 80 miles per hour, decimating the terrain and leaving giant currents, ripples, and gravel bars in its wake. Okay, think about in the day of Noah. What could you have done? Could you escape that? Of course not. You're going you're gonna to run away from that? Of course not. What are you going to do? Climb to the highest... Peak, well, we just heard that it, it, it went, covered, everything was covered. The highest peak was covered. The mountains were covered. This is a worldwide flood. It decimated everything, right? Of course it did. There you have these smooth patterns, right? So I won't even read that part. So here's the thing. It says, seeing like a geologist. It takes practice to see the world as a geologist does. When I first got my glimpse of the channel scab lens more than 20 years ago at Interstate 90, blah, 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 I was struck by the strange beauty by the rolling fields of weed yielding sterile landscape of rocky buttes. I had no explanation for the terrain. I did not need one. I had this primitive eye that looks at rocks and just sees rocks. But when I returned to the scab lens with Brett's story in mind, suddenly I was in an entirely different world. Look at this. I mean, you got a problem. There's no river leading to that. Water is coming from under the ground. Like Noah's, like they lifted it up. The ark was lifted up, right? All right. Mega flood that carved this canyon and shaped the surrounding landscape of eastern Washington state. Standing in the middle of the broad swath of scablands extended from horizon to horizon, my mind's eye could clearly see the floodwaters blasting through like a raging inland sea ripping it up everything not strong enough to stay moored that's funny i think that word we talk about we're anchored in the lord and moored with christ christ is our anchor driving through what's known as the ephrata fan a broad open area where floodwaters left the confines of the grand coulee and spread out and slowed as they neared what became what was what would become ancient lake lewis 
I easily understand why the landscape was riddled with boulders, as the water lost speed, it was dropping rocks that it was carrying, right? And when I stood in the lip of the dry falls of the Pothole Coulee, looking into the immense canyon with farmland on three sides and precipitous drops on the other, I felt what Brett was thinking when he looked at the map a century ago. If a river didn't carve this, what did? With the flood story in mind, it almost seems so obvious. In fact, that it's almost impossible to see the terrain and not see the flood waters that shaped it. Why then were the experts in Brett's day so blind to what now seems like a self-evident geological record? I posed that question to Vic Baker, a geologist with the University of Arizona who became a preeminent scablands expert in Brett's wake. When I met to tour several other regional features, it's the mistake people have made most in the history of science. Right? He's all science. He said, they forgot that nature has the answers, not us. Well, I mean, they're saying, like, if you're supposed to be following the data, you go where the data takes you. But these geologists didn't want to go where the data took them. Breath was making an argument, and no one was going into the field to see anything. Literally, these guys are saying, I just don't believe it. That, I just don't believe it. And I'm not going to go take a look at it to, to, <laughs> with my own eyes. But they're geologists. I mean, does that make sense to anyone? You're a geologist and you're not going to go to the field. Mind you, these guys are going to these schools, Harvard, Yale, you know, Princeton, you know, University of Chicago, like all these prestigious schools. And they're getting paid quite well. And they're not even doing their job. They're not even going to see what the, they're, they're geologists. Okay. They were just countering his arguments with theory. Sounds like faith. And because science, so because so, someone wrote a theory, right? Someone wrote a theory and said that this is how things must happen, gradual processes over a long periods of time, not cataclysmic. And they said, I believe that person. I'm by faith. What is faith? The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Well, no one was going into the field to see anything. They were just counting his arguments with theory. Substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And because scientists are first and foremost human beings, they loathe to change their theories of, or their mind because of mere, listen to this, data. Mere data. I mean, they're scientists, but why would I change my mind just because the data tells me to change it? So you see these rocks and boulders, just how they get there. Must have been quite... I mean, quite a gradual process of water flow to move boulders the size of small houses and cars, which are, I mean, we know cars are like five, six, seven, some cars, 10,000, small houses. I mean, come on, how heavy is a house? What kind of water, what kind of force? Are you telling me this was a trickle effect over gradually over thousands and thousands of years? All right. So it talks about these boulders now littering the efforts of fan or carried by torrents of water that gushed out of the of the canyon called the Grand Coulee. The largest rock is more than 20 feet tall, right? And that's over a period of time because things erode, right? So then he goes and tells me this story. Um, Baker told me the story as we looked out at the Palouse Falls, another dramatic cataract at the head of a massive canyon with a stream running through it that seemed comically out of scale, like a toddler wearing a grown man's boots Sometime in the late 50s, early 60s, a geologist named Aaron Walters brought one of Brett's most vocal critics, James Galuli, the one who'd call his ideas preposterous and incompetent, to the scablins to take a first-hand look. You want me to go look at the guy you're criticizing? Um, as they looked, a fool, what does this talk about? A lot of fool talking about someone who judges a thing before they hear at the matter. James Galuli the one who called his ideas preposterous and competent to the sky was taking for an As they looked at the side of the falls in the canyon, Galuli was dumbfounded by their scale. He like looked at it like, whoa, this is amazing. Galuli was just quiet the whole time, Baker said. And as they were leaving, he broke out into his immense laugh and said, how can anybody be so wrong? After resisting breast theory for decades, simply seeing the landscape with his own eyes had changed his mind. This guy is like uh, Thomas. He didn't, I won't believe until I see the nail, nails prints in his hands, right? The nails in his hands. 
well, where the nails were in his hands. Of course, for some of Brett's most stubborn critics, uh, the Pharisees, even eyewitness experience wasn't enough. Brett's arch adversary, Richard Foster Flint, a, wow, what a nice school, a Yale geologist who remained a premier authority in the field until the 1970s, spent years studying the scablins and resisted Brett's theory until he was virtually the only one left who did. He finally acknowledged the scablins flooding grudgingly with a single sentence in a textbook in 1971. But as philosopher Thomas Kuhn observed, new scientific truths often win the day not so much because opponents change their mind, but because they die off. But the time, by the time the Geological Society of America finally recognized Brett's work in the Penrose and with the Penrose Medal, the, fine, the field's highest honor, honor in 1979, Brett, remember this guy started as a high school teacher, went to school, got a PhD, all this stuff. He was 96 years old. He joked to his son, "All my enemies are dead, so I have no one to gloat over." Right? All his enemies are dead. So this is like this is like Noah, right? Noah would tell everybody, hey, get on the ark. <laughs> it's coming. Uh, who did Noah gloat over? Not that he should gloat, but I'm just saying it's kind of like that. It is tempting to see this story as a simple morality tale with a good guy, Jesus, lining up against a bad guy, Jesus, in a battle with open mind inquiry versus closed minded dogmatism. Closed minded dogmatism. Who's accused of being dogmatic? People who believe the KJV is God's word preserved and the other ones are false. People who believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, the life. There's only one way to be saved, and that's via Christ. People who believe that you got to, must, what must I do to be saved? Believe the gospel. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day, according to the scripture. People who believe that you can't lose your salvation for any reason, no matter what. That those who believe have passed from death to life and they shall not come into condemnation. Right? People who believe that it's an imputed righteousness of God that's given to us, Romans 4, 5. But that might just compound the error because it neglects the fact that scientists almost always favor their own theories over others. Right? That's Romans 1, 1. Right? Let's go to Romans 1, 1 right quick. Let's do it. Let's go to Romans 1, 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Well, the flood is a sign. Men want to look and they're like, I'm looking for a sign. Well, you got your sign. You already had your sign. But Jesus Christ says there'll be no sign but the sign of uh, Jonah. As Jonah was three days in the bell in the belly of a whale, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth, right? Jesus Christ, he died for our sins, he was buried, he rose again the third day, according to the scripture. The sign is the gospel. I'm here, I'm I'm giving you the banner right now, right? Because people already, God already told you what happened in the Old Testament. People go and they see the evidence and they don't believe it, right? People don't believe it, even though their their earth is bearing witness. They don't believe that. So because that which they may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it unto them. He didn't say God shown it unto some of them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Again, Godhead, not Trinity. So that they are without excuse. These geologists are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, right, they, knew, they don't know God like relationship, like son of God. They glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imagination. They want to keep their own the idols of their mind. They want to keep their own theory. They don't want to believe it. Even if they see it, some of them, they don't want to, they don't care to see it. So even when some of them see it, what happens? Their foolish heart was darkened. God gives them up, gives them over to a reprobated mind. You don't want to believe the gospel. You don't believe it's a free gift. You want to try to work and earn your way to heaven and look at the law and try to say, okay, God says, okay, fine. Professing themselves wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like what? Corruptible man. You got to be born again of the spirit. You must be born again, Nicodemus. And to birds and forfeited beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to the uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their bodies between themselves, who changed the truth 
of God into a lie. Hey, it's Ice Age. It's happened over many, many years. And worship and serve the creature, right? Earth did this. Mother Nature did this, right? Big Bang. And serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Right? So the Bible talks about that. He talks about these guys, right? So even then, though, when we're talking about this dogmatism, the thing compound the error, he talks about is all of their favorite their own theories over others, rarely these theories, and rarely are those theories completely right. And then he talks about these other guys who came in, uh, and, you know, they're going to say, well, it's not just one flood, there were other floods, blah, blah, you know. So, again, they, they just can't give it up. They, they even know this guy is proven pretty much beyond a shadow, he's proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Bible narrative is true. But then they got to keep throwing, well, the Ice Age, the Ice Age. And they're going to get that in front of our kids. And they're going to get your kids go to school. They're going to try to teach your kids that stuff in school, right? And then the religious schools are just as bad because they teach them a false gospel. And that makes them twice the sons of hell. It's easier to convince your kid about geology than have them be brainwashed on a false gospel with a false idol in their mind with uh, these false schools, religious schools, right? So he just shows you all the things um, that are true. Now I'm going to go back and I want to tell you why they didn't accept this theory. They didn't accept this guy's. Okay. I, I intentionally left this part out. I'm going to go, go here to the beginning of this article, right? And I want you to see the title first. Let's go back to the title. So you can see this, you know, formed by mega floods. They try to do plural, right? Satan's very tricky. Mega floods, plural, right? Not flood, right? So that's how Satan is really, really tricky. He will not concede. He must not give glory to God. Even if he's a false pastor, there has to be this false dichotomy of, well, that's scientists. And even though I'm a false pastor, I'm going to say I agree with the Bible, but then I'm going to give you a false gospel, right? So Satan plays good cop, bad cop. Remember, he disguises himself as an angel of light. He needs to have a he needs to have the uh, dichotomy of well the, he needs to have the horrible beast you know person horrible person so that he can disguise himself as an angel of light. He needs to juxtapose himself, right, right. So he needs to have somebody who fits the image of all ungodliness so that he can then come and be very peaceful and visit you in the hospital and ask about your kids and 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 visit the sick and shut in and just be that angel of light who talks to Jesus and says, Hey, do you if you're hungry, turn these stones to bread. You know? Satan, was he mean in the garden? Was he was he quote quote mean um, when he was taught when he was tempting Jesus in in the wilderness? Right? So, you know, you got to think about this thing. He needs a juxtaposition. So, let me uh, go. And this is the part I held back. It was geological heresy for almost a century, ever since Charles Leal, 1830, text, Principles of Geology, set the standard for the field. So, here's their God, right? It's Charles Leal, right? The text, the principles of geology, set the standard for the field. It had been assumed that geological change was gradual and uniform. Always a product of, as I'll put it, causes not in operation. Right? And floods of quasi, quasi, right? Biblical proportion certainly did not meet that standard. It didn't matter how meticulous Brett's research was or how sound his reasoning might be. He seemed to be, just the appearance, he seemed to be advocating a return to the what? Geological dark ages. Talked about how the Satan makes, tries to make darkness light, right? He inverts the truth. He perverts the truth, right? Talks about if that light that I have be darkness, how dark is that light? If what you say is light is darkness, how dark is that light? 
when scientists use catastrophic explanation. So there was a time, apparently, that scientists did use catastrophic explanation for Earth's features. Um, okay, I was going to pause because my son was, okay? For Earth's features to buttress theological presuppos... Oh, okay. Earth's features to buttress theological presumptions about the age of a creator's divine handiwork. It was unacceptable. How did canes and cataracts form? By rivers, of course, over millions of years, not gigantic floods, period. Right? The world hates people. We all at one time hated God, right? Remember, God says they, says they hate you. Remember, they first hated me. They will hate you because it says we're not we're in the world, but not of the world, right? That's the whole representation of the world being a world of sin, right? The light came into the world, then the darkness comprehended it not. The world is full of darkness, right? So God's explaining. So I just want to show that. I thought that was very interesting. Um, the article that you can look up again is... New, uh, National Geographic, it's formed by mega floods. This place fooled scientists for decades. So I think this would be great if there was an actual pastor who actually believed the gospel, who knew that you couldn't lose salvation, who actually believed the KJV is God's preserved word, would just go in front of his congregation and just use this as an example, you know, with kids and, and all this kind of stuff. Just, you know, and you should do that with your kids. It's like, just go and teach them how to be critical think thinkers to test all things, right? And, um, just show how the world is foolish, how the world need, can't believe it. So they try to do little sneaky things by saying mega floods instead of one flood. And then they say, well, we agree there was a bunch of water, but it happened over an ice age, over billions of years, right? And so they concede on one hand, but they never concede to, they never concede like Romans 1 1 says, that they just, they, they still want to believe in the creation and not the creator. All right, so I hope that was helpful. Again, to be saved is very simple. Uh, you know, you're saved simply by believing the gospel. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's 1 Corinthians 15. And then once you believe, you cannot lose your salvation for any reason. In fact, you know, just to show you um, this John 5, 24, which is beautiful. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my words and believe on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. I showed you that. Let me go ahead and show you the scriptures too, because I feel like if I showed you that verse, I should just go ahead and show you the show you the scriptures. Uh, let's see. Moreover, brother, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein you stand. It's talking about by which you're saved, if you keep remembering what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. You gotta believe the true gospel. You can't believe a false gospel. You can't change it or pervert it in your mind. And he's gonna tell you what that gospel is. He says, For I deliver unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Right? He's gonna deliver you to that gospel, the true gospel, how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Right? That's the gospel. And you believe that you pass from death to life. All right? I want to actually keep this one short. <sighs> That's not short. Um, but anyway, thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. I apologize for the background noise. Um, God bless.